Ladies and gentlemen of the crypto space, we're live on a Friday, April 28th at 11.39 a.m. We're going to talk technicals today and put it into context of the standard stories that I tell and understanding time horizon, where we are in the cycle. And without further ado, our main screen, this is the Bitcoin chart. Uh, I should make it better, right? Let's look at the Bitcoin chart from a perspective that actually matters. <laughs> you know, context as well. You place it uh, amongst the, uh, with, with like M2 or global M2 preferably as the backdrop, but we don't need to do that because we could assume and look at that chart discreetly and compare things verbally or put things into context verbally. Now, short term, the market is in a state of despair. Degeneracy is rampant. There is little to no investment opportunity, meaning uh, there's two types of opportunity. There's predatorial opportunity, of which you are either the predator or the prey. And I'm telling you, unless you've got uh, seven figures sitting around in liquidity, uh, you're going to be prey. Um, or unless, uh, even if you <laughs> find maybe... You, you have a modicum of dev experience and you want to get malicious, the malicious actors don't need seven figures. All they need is 50 grand and they publish a contract in about 15 seconds using, uh, you know, just one click to publish a contract and, and 20 bucks. And uh, the, the, we've heard that story of the of the address that has published thousands of rugs over the last two years and that's all it takes and then you don't need a million dollars worth of liquidity for that I mean, you need a million dollars worth of liquidity to interact with a, an asset that's two three four five million dollars and dominate the the liquidity dominate the lp position and drive market activity in a particular direction for a short period of time i mean there's nothing going to be uh, sustained. There's going to be no sustained directionality in a market like this. The sustained directionality requires a constant flow of liquidity. Uh, so it's the same phenomena whether you're in this type of market condition or a bullish type of market condition. The difference is the knock-on effects. If you have a three to five million dollar asset, you pump a million dollars in, you drive up the price 20%, you dominate the liquidity, other liquidity is going to flow in. Because there's more liquidity on the sidelines. This is a drained liquidity, deflating environment. There's no none of that liquidity on the sidelines, at least not a sustained amount of it. You're going to have the, a small amount of capital chase, drive it up another 20, 30, 40, 50%. But guess what? The guy who pumped in a mill is going to clear a half a million dollar gain in a week. So this is that type of predatorial environment. The other opportunity in this environment is the lows, to buy value at a discount. The complexity there is there is no indication that this is the, the market's directionality is going to change anytime soon. And when I say anytime soon, the time horizon in that regard is not a half a decade. A decade, we're probably talking about a year time horizon you have to inspect things in a month over month basis because that gives you your earliest indication that something is changing structurally with regard to liquidity flows month over month anything less and you're going to drive yourself nuts and you end up flip-flopping left and right because clearly if you look at this chart you could have bought any time and that's probably the case right now and in five years time will be 300 400 500 why not i mean the directionality is there and the capital will chases appreciation and over a long enough time frame that the, the this, this asset will draw in that kind of capital i never have have mm, argued with the directionality of Bitcoin. I have never argued with the primary merits of what uh, proponents and even maximalists say about the asset uh, relative to different countries. It could be an interesting place to park some capital, albeit I think dollars are more meaningful because they're easily accepted as payment depending on payment infrastructure that's available. Uh, if there's seamless liquidity between an asset like Bitcoin and dollars, you can make payments using Bitcoin, using dollars as the payment vehicle. 
Now that is reasonable. If you don't have access to that kind of technology, it's kind of a shitty uh, place to store money. Uh, it's not easily accessible money, or and that's the whole point of a payment system is to alleviate the frictions, the burden of, uh, of either uh, retaining a certain amount of capital and spending a certain amount of capital. You need the payments infrastructure to facilitate that flow of capital to service your daily needs. So it's relative to country, uh, time horizon, payment technology that's available and how you compose your portfolio. Um, you know, I, I have said recently that I like the longer term time frames. A month is getting a little too taxing for me nowadays. Uh, obviously, in the different market conditions, uh, I think this statement would vary uh, if it was with volatility. If there's increased volatility, increased liquidity, positive sum game, yeah, you're probably going to want to look at charts on a little shorter term time frame to see indications of potential directionality, especially directionality change. Um, uh, but generally speaking, in a negative sum environment, uh, you know, I'm not engaging in predatorial activity. And predatorial is not necessarily malicious. It's just capital gain strategy. This is not my interest. I'm a passive capital allocator. So my, from my perspective, the activity in this type of environment is looking for the cheapest value that I could find, discounts on value. So I'm not necessarily looking at a Bitcoin type of asset. It's not a value producer. It's not an enterprise. Uh, it's a place to park capital and as I was talking earlier how do you spend that capital so it's a different story per different country so this is not an asset that I'm necessarily interested in uh, it has about two years worth of spend time horizon and an, and it's cyclical give or take two years of spendability and then two years of depreciation where you don't want to spend something if it's depreciated you want to spend it while it's appreciated so I call Bitcoin generally transitory money. Uh, the, this volatility will subside over the years is a common argument. Uh, but irrespective of that, you want to, if, if you take the emotion of trying to make money out of the equation, you spend it while it's appreciated. You don't spend it while it's depreciated. So that means you could spend it sometimes and you can't spend it other times. Therefore, it's transitory transitorily useful as money uh, and that's obviously um, very dependent on your uh, your geographical locale in the US and Europe you have good payment technologies where you can seamlessly spend with debit cards maybe in Asia I don't I'm not familiar with the products available there uh, but right now uh, you know you DCA it into if you treated Bitcoin like with tax lots what you would do with traditional uh, brokerage accounts. If you bought Bitcoin at forty, fifty, sixty thousand dollars, it makes no sense to spend it. You can't spend that money. You you bought it at a higher price. So if you bought some Bitcoin at ten, fifteen, you could spend that. That's appreciated. Uh, it, so it makes it complicated. When should you spend it versus when you should not spend it? That's the transitory money makes it very frustrating. And then, um, you know, then the argument is maybe something else is outperforming, maybe some equity or some gold or other precious metal. And, and that is the rotation of capital, moving capital from one thing to another. And that whole process drives me nuts. So it's a lovely chart. What could I use it for? What could I do with this chart? What could I do with this information? How could I use it to compose my balance sheet uh, to best serve myself and my family? And it's not very useful to me. You know, my, my mindset as an entrepreneur, as someone who's interested in business and enterprise, I want to own business. I want to own enterprise. And that's why I came up with the concept of the pizza shop. As I, you know, it's a business, an enterprise, and it's a simple enterprise. It's just a commodity, raw materials, a little bit of labor, and you're selling a product. Input versus output, Co uh, supply versus uh, uh, sales, and that is an, an easy way to represent any activity where there's a capex and income associated with that capex. So if you buy 
a dividend-bearing instrument, whether it's that kind of definition of a traditional uh, brokerage available security, or a dividend that's available in what we're aware of in the crypto markets is the same type of concept that the same type of modeling can apply. Now that's ex that this is why those types of instruments are more attractive to me as the as capable of being defined in terms of enterprise ownership. You deploy CapEx, you own something and that ownership of uh, what we define as an enterprise is productive there's cash flow there's good times there's bad times there's inf inflation in the economy there's deflationary pressures and you're making less money and we look forward to good times where we're making more money and that type of story is much more attractive to me than uh, the capital gains type of uh, way of interacting with markets so this chart looks lovely let's uh, let's drill in a little bit so for the fun of it we could look at some technicals so we broke down significantly from that long-term trend um, but it seems like we've pushed back to it it looks like we're on it so this is a position of weakness from that trend line because we're not above it albeit from a 200 SMA perspective uh, you know it it looks decent that that's kind of like ignoring the trend line so you know we really need another couple of longer term time frame uh candles from weeklies and monthlies to really get a sense uh, which is more significant the trend line or the moving averages uh trends are significant i really like moving averages price levels a lot of folks a lot of technical folks like to look at in that regard as a little precedence other than the fact that we're above our most previous all-time high back in 18. Um, so technically speaking I like this structure. It's not something that sings to me I want to buy it. That's uh, it's an expensive price tag and sure uh, you know I'd fall back to the arguments that I had earlier. You know, obviously, if it's three, four, five, six hundred thousand in the coming years, it's not really an expensive price tag, and that's really not an unreasonable expectation considering this chart. This chart's pretty cool. From a six-month time frame, 1981 to 2023, Global M2 is just up, 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 and up. More currency units in circulation. Obviously, uh, there's a T on the right-hand side. One. 0.249 quadrillion I would imagine these are potentially all dollar denominated even though it's the euro and the Japanese uh, balance the M2 supply as well I guess it's dollar denominated how they create this technical indicator uh, but that is clearly an up and to the right type of an <laughs> expression to say the least uh, so the, this is where Bitcoin comes from it comes from a uh, the, the narrative associated with a, an ever-expanding currency supply, which needs to expand. And I, I, I no longer, or I, I guess I was in the camp of maybe earlier in my time in the crypto space, a very Bitcoin-centric camp, and oh, they're always going to debase the currency. But the more I understand the way the currency works, you really need to. And you can't have an appreciating payment currency. Um, you, uh, but they really suck at it. They really suck at controlling uh, the, the, the value of the payment currency relative to co consumer-facing prices. They're horrible at it. And the problem is it's not adequate because it's one currency for the globe. Meanwhile, all these regions have different pricing. And it's just an absolute mess, and it, and it doesn't work. But I'm very much in that camp of expecting or or hoping for a payment currency uh, that is stable relative to consumer prices. And that's just not what we have. Uh, it's a, their, their tools are completely inadequate and ineffective at achieving that much sought after result and behavior for the currency. So it's a shitty currency, uh, but uh, as Brent says it's the best uh, of what there is and that's not necessarily a good thing 
and that doesn't mean something else is necessarily better. Look, we, we talk about all coins and, and Bitcoin's position and strength because it was the first. I mean, what was much before, much earlier than Bitcoin is this currency, these fiat currencies. So they're not going anywhere. Um, the smaller ones uh, self-destruct relative to, you know, I pull up uh, U.S. currency units. The smaller ones self-destruct relative to U.S. currency units. But the prevailing, the majority currency units uh, have strength. Uh, you know, if the U.S. defaults, you're going to be paid in the, the, the U.S. Uh, credit default swaps. You'd be paid in euros. That's next on the list. Was it going to be yen with the shit show they got going on with their balance sheet? Balance of payments? Their bond market? No. <laughs> so euro's really next on the list and that's in a shitty situation the bifurcation that goes on from country to country how do you have one central bank over all those countries i uh, you know clearly you know we were so critical of the traditional system and rightfully so uh, but that does not automatically tell us that the stuff that we have in crypto is better suited for global payments processing in any way shape or form you know, FPI is probably interesting, uh, a, a currency that adjusts its value relative to um, the CPI, which is a, a shitty measurement of consumer price inflation of one country. So, you know, economic theory and then the science and, and, and everything they do, you know, it just comes up short for what I really think society needs. So that's besides the point. Uh, we we were talking about technicals. It's supposed to be about te technicals, and they always get into macro and the structure of things. Um, Joe's in the house. I appreciate it. Smash the likes. Tapsy. Good morning. Saw you loader around the llamas NFT. I'd love a llama NFT if I could get it at a decent price. I sure as hell will get one. Complexities with regard to privacy. I don't necessarily want to buy it with my main account, uh, my my balance sheet account. I wouldn't mind owning something anonymous where you don't have to see everything that I do. A little bit of privacy, so that's a complexity. Miss uh, Stuff like Tornado Cash isn't available to fund uh, a, a, a relatively anonymous account. I mean, everyone will uh, know I own the account because I have the llama, and I would say I have the llama, but they don't need to see the funds got transferred to that account from this account, and then you have all the transaction history, so... Privacy is a very complicated topic where things are. Something I was talking about, we were talking about on Leviathan News this morning. Alex is in the house, Lighthouse, Brian, Jesse, Joe, Jam, Bullion charges less for crypto payment than credit debit card payment. Right. So that's interesting. You know, bottom line is 10 years ago, five years ago, gold was a horrible investment relative to Bitcoin. If you Bought Bitcoin five years ago, you did very well. And both uh, nominal and inflation adjusted returns. Just remember with assets that aren't productive, non productive assets, when someone buys Bitcoin today, who does it benefit the most? Not the person buying it. The person buying it is exposed to the narrative I just described, the transitory money. You can't spend it unless it's appreciated money. Otherwise, you're spending it at a loss, and that makes no sense. But who's the benefit? It supports all the people that bought it before you. It's still the same type of uh, 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 forces in play as traditional equities, uh, capital gains, and uh, distribution of capital, what drives price up is people buying it after you. So, so that mechanic still is in play. And, and you'll notice that maximalists uh, tout their, it's the only one because they've been in it for so long. It's a very different perspective, uh, whether you're, you've been in something for a period of time and uh, versus trying to get into it. And I think that is probably the biggest uh, issue I have with the maximalists is, um, is that uh, time perspective. Having been in it for so long, you have a biased perspective for why someone should newly get into it. You know, buying something at $30,000 is not the same as buying it from $500 for going to $30,000. And buying these assets and 
achieving appreciation gives nothing, uh, no, does not aid the capital management process. You can't just have appreciating assets. You can't just have a balance sheet of assets that are volatile, that go down and up in price. You need to have a balance sheet of pro productive balance sheet. You have to own business. And that's why I focus on that over savings. In fact, I think of owning business as a form of savings. I'd rather own business than save currency. Whatever that current, whatever form that currency may come in, I think owning business is more valuable. And of all the businesses, these are the most interesting businesses, the businesses that we talk about. This business, this business will be here in 10, 20, 30 years as long as Ethereum still exists. This business will be here. There's no bankruptcy. There's no insolvency. There's none of the risks associated with traditional enterprise that can play a role in anything that occurs to this business in the future. That's the best business in the world. The, the, the natural disaster, which region? It affects the st overall, what, hash rate for a period of time until uh, more validators come online in a different region that wasn't affected by the natural disaster? This, this is the most resilient business I've ever seen in my entire life. Low energy at this point, so it's not dependent on a, a robust supply of, of energy availability. So... The, just the more I think about it, it's this is probably the most boring opportunity in the entire crypto markets. This is an asset that a lot of people would say is cursed, and they're obviously thinking about it from a price appreciation standpoint, and they don't have the right perspective on it, which is the enterprise perspective. And the fact that it's horizontal in price action is extraordinary. And we see this horizontal price action in very few assets. Let's look at Velo. Velo is probably the furthest out of the spectrum I would look. I mean, look at the price action. Look at that. Horizontal price action after, you know, just <laughs> exponential appreciation. But I love that horizontal price action. But look at this. This is actually a bit of compression. So we're starting to see the formation of some technical patterns. I haven't drawn lines in God knows how long. I'll draw some lines. I mean, that's obvious. Obviously a trend line. <laughs> some very nice trend lines. Maybe you draw it from there. Something like that. It's very much a triangular compression, higher lows, lower highs. Uh, three, one, two. So you probably want to wait for a third. So you want to find, see this find support. See if it hits resistance. It could do a halfway down and then it breaks through. But there's no liquidity in the system for follow through. You see a break of trend in a bull market where, there, where optimism has an inflow of $100 million a week. Yeah, you break a trend that you're going to have a bullish impulse to the upside. But in this type of market, you break a trend to the upside and it's like, really? It's like a bottle rocket. It's like a, a giant picture of firework. That's like a giant firework, but it's like a bottle rocket. Like, deep. It, it's an un, under underwhelming break of trend to the upside. And it could easily be an overwhelming break of trend to the downside because fear spreads really quick in a negative sum environment, a draining liquidity environment. But that's actually quite nice from a technical perspective. Note, I'm going out of my comfort zone looking at the one day. <laughs> And there's just not enough data to look at it on like a, like a weekly, really. Three day is actually quite nice chart. And then we go to Aura. I mean, look, look uh, this is the second asset in all of crypto, everything since late 2019. 
that has price action that I find interesting considering my narrative that I hold most dear today, the enterprise narrative. The, the, the horizontal price action is quite intriguing. Buck 54 bucks, clearly highly volatile. This is in a shitty position technically. Not much technical analysis I could offer on this other than maybe some levels. Um, you could see this as either you're at a resistance because obviously at this price point it expressing any resistance invalidates all of this price action completely. You see that, right? Need a horizontal line. So everything below that line, the fact that it's resistance here it's below it. it means all of that above it is invalidated from overwhelmingly a significance standpoint. It's insignificant. It's been invalidated. And we have the same phenomena on the curve chart. There's resistance here. So the moving averages are significant. Levels are much more significant. Horizontal line. You can almost invalidate from this. So... There's so many lines on this chart, but look at um, look at this big wick. Because let's let's look at this structurally. Let me zoom in. So 2020 breach to the upside, large wick. So there's a big support at uh, buck 058, but we're below it. So let's draw the line there. So same concept that I was just describing with or we're below. What was support, Not a big wick of support, but then it broke below, retest from the bottom to the upside, failed to breach that previous support back in uh, May of 21 is now a resistance level, albeit uh, this 10 SMA on the monthly is interesting. That is a quite an expression of support uh, to months of wicks below support so that's obviously f folks dcaing and twapping at that particular price point needs to get above the monthly twap well not necessarily twapping on the 10 sma the twaps up here uh, but you know averaging in at that particular moving average um so we're at a at, at just a boring price point, but look at the horizontal price action. That's what I appreciate the most. Never printed a lower low. Mid range, a dollar. I mean, obviously six. That was a highly appreciated point, but a dollar compared to what? Thirty cents, and then thirty nine cents, and it's two hundred plus, two hundred fifty percent higher than those price points. Velo looks interesting. This is actually interesting from a technical perspective. So what would I then think of? I would then go over to liquidity. And I'm like, all right. Structurally, I wouldn't mind checking out Velo uh, is quite heavily dependent on its OP financing. So I would have to inspect the health of, uh, of OP and its price point. But if you look at liquidity, stables overview and you go over to optimism oof oof five percent drain in a week look at all this folks 32 million dollars yesterday came out of optimism that is quite a lot of gains that large actors are taking. That's not yield. That's not 20%, 30% yield, and that's a large number. That's not 5% yield. That's not people doing a couple of claims and taking out $32 million. That's capital gains. And the, the large actors that bridge over a couple million dollars are able to extract a, a multiple or two. One, two, three X. Take out an extra mil, extra two. So that's not an environment that's, that I'm interested in. That's a predatorial environment. So how do I digest all of that considering this relatively decent technical structure? There's no action to take. There's no action I can take. I got to wait.
and I would look for a breakout and maybe you need confluence like an inflow of liquidity maybe you see five ten percent maybe you see global m2 start to tick up maybe you see us m2 start to tick up and those conditions aren't there that type of confluence isn't there to suggest deploying capital is overwhelmingly something to be comfortable with it's something to fear in this type of environment deployment of capital has a huge amount of risk associated with it the larger the capital the larger the target for predators to capitalize on so this is an environment where i as i said i favor the acquisition of an enterprise asset at the cheapest price point possible so if we go over to aura you know you want cheaper cheaper is the be cheaper is better so if you see a nice thrust you see a nice liquidation cascade uh, you see pressure obviously spot is really driving most of the market there's not necessarily any open interest or leverage associated with Aura, so you're not necessarily going to see the big wicks. What you're seeing is spot price action, where folks are either, it's expected to be sold, it's a yield asset, uh, but the yield asset is counterbalanced by the revenue that it surfaces, the cash flow that it surfaces. you got to be paid to purchase the asset, and it's not paying enough. When you see it not appreciating is not paying enough so what would cause it to start paying more more third-party revenue uh, more third-party vote rentals so for aura to appreciate you might need to see today's friday so let's look at llama air force you want to start seeing dollar per vl aura tick up and that would be a good indication so cheaper aura uh, unless this starts to tick up 22 59, 21. Is it going to reload? 57, 20. 56. I mean, you're talking a couple of pennies. Where's the 10 cents, 15 cents, 20 cents? And that, that'll change the equation. You need to see significant, something change with regard to the flow of capital. Uh, yeah, it's not going to stick at 13 cents. The the second uh, uh, hidden hand, uh, the the delegates vote, this will drop down to five six cents. Um, but if you start to see VL aura increase, dollar per VL aura increase, that would be a confluence indication to um, suggest that aura should probably appreciate as a result of increased cash flow to VL aura. So I would expect continued depreciation. Maybe you find support around here, buck ninety. At some point, it gets cheap enough where the market is pricing it as a good uh, a good value, and the average actor says, "All right, it's gotten cheap enough," and this is where I take my position. So you got a couple of price ranges, a couple of values: a buck ninety-three, buck seventy, and then a buck forty. Catch the buck forties. That'd be pretty interesting. That's a good number. So you never spend your whole stack. You always have to have cash. You can't buy anything unless you have cash on the sidelines. So, you know, buy a little bit. You have to, and th that goes into composition. So you define what you want to have. What do I want? What assets do I want? And what kind of balance do I want? 10%, 20%? What sizing, position sizes? And what is your target? What is your goal? And... And if you think it's going to go down, you surely shouldn't buy the entire position size. Uh, if you think it's going to go down for the next six months, and you're like, all right, I hope uh, I'll buy 20% now of the position size that I want. Let's say I want the portfolio to be 10% aura. I would buy 20% uh, of that, which would be 2% total portfolio of it. And, uh, and that means I have more cash to buy as it goes down to to take the position size that uh, I'm targeting. So in the meantime, as it's depreciating, speaking as someone that owns the enterprise prior to what we're discussing right now, I don't have to take a position. I have outstanding positions in all the assets that we talk about. Um, there's nothing to do. There's no action to take. And that gives me my great peace of mind. As all of this insanity is going on, all this bullshit and drama, regulation and shitcoins, um, the extent of what I have to 
do is understand where we are from a conditions perspective and uh, and how much cash flow the asset is producing from a dollar per VL or a perspective. Um, a couple of folks asked me to look at some technicals. Let me see if I could find... Dan asked me to look at some technicals. Let me find it. Uh, convex and sin. Okay. V3, 852,000 in liquidity. Not necessarily the most liquid market, but let's zoom out. So, what is convex relative to curve? You know, it's a proxy, obviously. It has a quantity of curve that it's in control of, and the whole fundamental argument of it's undervalued or overvalued, depending on the amount of co uh, curve as well as FXS that it controls from a, uh, uh, a governance voting perspective. I mean, there's so much support down here in this region. $3 and change. I mean, this is a nice zone of accumulation, even relative to its initial launch bottom. I'll highlight that. I mean, look at this whole zone right here. I mean, that's just an accumulation zone. I think it's above its accumulation zone in some regards. This looks like a ceiling, so it's sitting on the ceiling. So this isn't really an opportunity to buy at this price point, but as you get towards the bottom of the accumulation zone, even maybe a little bit lower towards the historic low back in 21, maybe you could drop down the top a little bit, somewhere around there to this bottom right here back in September of 22. Uh, that's nice accumulation zone. So if you target the portfolio at 10% and you could fire off five 20% clips, which would be 2% total portfolio clips, you know, 380, hope it depreciates, $3, 250, and if you get your high high dollar zone, buck 80, buck 90, that that'd be ridiculous. And those are good opportunities. Uh, the, 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 this is buying opportunity season for value assets at the biggest discount possible. This asset will be here in 10 years. Many assets won't, but this will. Curve will be here in 10 years. Many assets won't, but it will. Regulatory uncertainty with uh, with fracks, but what a dominant technology play. From a technology play in the crypto markets, this probably has the biggest story to be told. How many markets it touches, how uh, strategic and just aggressive they've been uh, with expanding and, and reaching their goals. Quite extraordinary from a protocol perspective. Uh, Killis is in the house. Good morning. Uh, Joe, I have a stake in my firm. I own yield bearing crypto and I want to start storing value in silver coins. Silver's cool. The problem is it's a pain in the ass to spend. Um, now you could send the silver coins off to like a JM bullion or you walk into a broker and you take a, a hit relative to the spot. Uh, so it's not very liquid with regard to a spendable currency. Um, I don't give a shit whether you could spend uh, with a, a, rel a specific state says, yeah, you could spend it as a currency. No, because you need its spot value to extract the most value. So it's really annoying from an investment standpoint. Um, the way I like to think of an investment, I like to think of the entire investment portfolio I have as a capacity to give me spendable currency. So it's just a pain in the ass. Um, Bitcoin's much more liquid. You, know, you could literally load Bitcoin right onto a debit card directly. Like in an hour, you could load Bitcoin, transaction time considered, onto a debit card and walk into a store and spend it. You can't do that shit with gold coin. You literally need to drive over to a, a broker you know, coin shop and and sell it. And depending on where you are, all right, fine. Maybe you could do that in an hour, but you're going to take a hit relative to spot. And, and that's just, I, I, you know, Bitcoin's much more, it's digital. So that is a, a, the frictionless process of spendability. 
because the liquidity is there. That's what I was talking about uh, earlier. Um, uh, money is only as useful as money that's not in spendable form is only as use of, useful uh, as its liquidity with the sp a spendable form of money. So, you know, crypto is useful in that regard because very seamlessly converted to a spendable currency and the, all these products and services offered lately uh, are just completely designed to facilitate that spending process. Uh, so that's just wonderful. You, you can't really do that with securities. Um, yeah, you have margin and uh, TD Ameritrade or like a Fidelity account. So you can, you know, why? Well, actually, they, there's a, you have a debit card on your brokerage account. I've never really done anything like that, um, but you could wire to a bank. And, but I, some would argue that you have a credit card and and it, the you know two day settlement process on a security transaction. You sell it, you look, and then you transfer the capital by the end of the month to pay a credit card bill. And some would say, all right, you could do all that. But I don't I don't like credit in that regard. I like to have money and spend money that I have. I don't really spend money that I don't have. Um, maybe that's just the way I grew up. I either So I, I prefer debit over credit. I'll be a credit does offer rewards. So I use credit, but I pay my bill like three, four, five times a month. I never carry a balance at all. Anyway, that's a digression. I'm all over the place today. But hopefully I got some good points out and some good stories. Uh, Dan wanted me to look at sin. What's sin? Sin is uh, synapse. Cross chain. I haven't seen their website in quite a while. Let's take a look. Is that a Uni V3? That's a Uni V3 website. I guess everyone's taken a piece of uh, Uni V3 software ever since the IP or the protections lapsed. Um, nice looking website. From chain to chain. Nice options. I'm not too interested. I'm more interested in, uh, obviously, um, Stargate. And, uh, oh, what was the other one? Oh, my God. What uses Stargate? I forget the name of the protocol that I like. That's very useful on stream to forget the name of the protocol you like. But, obviously, Stargate, I think, has uh, more scale and scope than just a bridge, cross-chain messaging. Uh, so multi-chain has that component as well, but Stargate, I think, is the market leader. And they came after as a technological offering. It's very rare for a technological offering after the status quo to become what I would argue is the dominant force in a particular market segment. And I think Stargate is a rare example of that occurring. It's not like any of the... AMMs that came after uh, well, Uniswap have dominated, uh, or a curve for that matter as well. If you go over to DeFi, yeah. I mean, nothing, nothing comes close. There's $4.41 billion worth of liquidity on curve. Uh, well, the only thing that comes close is Uniswap. Now, that's an interesting one. So as much as the volume is there on Uniswap, the liquidity is uh, 300 billion dollars more on curve so the curve dominates pancake swap 2.19 billion i mean that's what is that the that's the closest is the d app is an amm compound is a money market balancer 1.23 billion so pancake swap bsc and then balancer on four chains at this point what the hell other chains are pancake is pancake swap on? What other chains is pancake swap on? Hmm. Whatever. No interest. No interest. 
Not interested in that BSC stuff. Um, present Joe's in the house. Trey Tapioca. Well, that's not live yet. So obviously we're all interested in what's going to go on with Tapioca. Tapioca hits the Ave narrative as a money market, but a cross-chain money market. Uh, it's not. That's not what I was looking for. The for, uh, it's an exchange that uses um, uh, uh, Stargate. Um, oh my God, ha- hash flow? No hash. Uh, that's zero hash. Anyway, whatever. You know, this was. This was when, um, ever since the meta aggregator came out from the Llama, I don't really use anything other than it for swapping. Hash flow. There it is. Whatever their picker is. Hash flow uses Stargate. So not much from an opportunity perspective, but from a tech stack, I'm pretty sure they're getting some good investor attention, um, some good VC attention. But this is very cool. But what, there's no point in going here to this website. You go to the Llama, the meta aggregator. This is, from a DeFi perspective, this is the go-to. This is the biggest offering at all of DeFi. It literally tells you all the price points, and you get the best price point. Wild. Let's go back to the charts and see if I could give you guys any additional information. Anyone else ask for? You guys got any tickers you want me to look at? We'll look at some technicals today. I'll look at some technicals. (laughs) Someone said Pepe coin. Oh, dear Lord. I mean, that is a triangular compression. I mean, memes are a big deal. I wouldn't trust shit like this. So, hmm. You play it from a technical perspective. But where's the liquidity going to come from? I don't even care if there's opportunity, really. I wouldn't even play it from a technical perspective. One, two, three... You know, find support, and then it breaks out. What, is this going to push new highs? Do you really want this to be the source of capital, to be the story? Yeah, I made money in Pepe coin, and then I had no idea what to do with it, and I bought some other shit coin. You need to understand how to manage the capital. It's more important to understand how to manage the capital than to have the capital, because even if you make the capital, if you don't know how to manage the capital, you're not going to keep the capital. So you might as well learn how to manage the capital first and then make the capital second. It's a heck of a triangular compression, actually. Lit, Stargate, Talman, very nice. What's Mux? But let's take a look at, uh, well, Lit. I had Lit up. Oh, I'll talk about uh, Liquidy. It's probably on my list, my very short list of things that I'm interested in. So let's that horizontal price action I was talking about. It's at a heck of a support level. <clears throat> so that has a lot of tags of support. Um, they've made some nice protocol adjustments. OLED Redemptions will finance uh, lit cash flow. So that's meaningful. Balancer cash flow is there, albeit it's relatively marginal. We'll see what happens with transaction fees and where they reallocate to. Um, you know, for now, I think they'll just keep recycling that to vote rentals. Um, overall, I think it's making decent uh, choices uh, from a Uniswap perspective. You know, even though even though Curve has the majority of liquidity on mainnet, or has the majority of liquidity, period, uh, Uniswap has the volume. Yields, uh, sexes. Look, look at the volume here. I mean, just Uniswap dominates $1.76 billion. I mean, who the fuck is trading on Uniswap? Seriously, who's buying and selling stuff on Uniswap? I mean, seriously, what kind of insanity is that? I mean, Uniswap is never, never on this list. Ever. 
you just don't get the swap rates. It is not cost effective at all to pretty much ever use Uniswap. So who the hell is using it? What kind of insanity is that shit? STG. Let's look at Stargate. So not overwhelmingly interesting from a cash flow perspective, but obviously one of my 2021 narratives, I believe, uh, was seamless cross-chain liquidity, and obviously Stargate and Layer Zero are right up that alley. I uh, sized this for myself at a relatively modest, maybe like 1% of the portfolio, uh, give or take. And uh, it's just not productive from a cash flow standpoint, unfortunately. It does surface cash flow, though. Uh, so obviously, you know, you have a large enough position. It's it's cash flow, but there's not much cash flow. I got four. It's like, actually, it's, is that monthly? So it's two twelve a month on seventeen. I don't even know. It's not too much revenue. Um, what eight, ten, twelve percent? I wish they obviously displayed it. That'd be interesting. One point four six percent. 1.46, is that the APY? The APY displayed is based on data from the last claim period. Obviously, that's very modest, if that's really what the percent is, 1.46%. So that's not very productive. So that's not there's not much of an incentive to purchase the asset if it's not paying a significant cash flow. So that introduces a complexity. So this is a tech play from a tech standpoint. VCs are very interested in it. And liquidity composition is quite extraordinary. Notice the majority of LP position. Look at that. Pancake has 2.18 because this 1.7 to 1.9 has been a very common number for a long time. So liquidity is very um, actively managed. And who's managing it is quite interesting. There's a constant trickle of buy pressure and sell pressure on the chains, the cross-chain arbitrage. It's quite interesting to watch the order books. Uh, if you watch, is this Trader Joe? Uh, let's look at Trader Joe on Arbitrum. Joe on Arbitrum. Watch these books. Uh, Arbitrum, Trader Joe, Stargate, and you're going to see the stream of the buys and sells, and they're very interesting. Very interesting to watch the sizes and the consistency uh, and the ticks of uh, relatively small uh, buys and sells. Um, very interesting behavior. Raul, hello. Uh, Arcane, maybe someone washes money on uni through LPs. I don't know. Obviously, there's a lot of malicious activity on Uniswap LPs and all the shit coins and the rugs and all that activity. And that's what attracts uh, a, a good part of people just getting into crypto is all the, you know, those stupid meme coins and Pepe stuff. So, you know, that's why the activity is there. And that's really why uh, Bunny's on my radar as a consideration, because that's meaningful. Uh, Uniswap does not have the vast majority of liquidity. Curve has more liquidity uh, than Uniswap, but Uniswap has 10 times the volume, the daily volume. It's the largest exchange volume in the entire crypto space is directly on Uniswap, even though we obviously see uh, that Uniswap is clearly just something you do not engage with if you want to get a good trade at all. Uh, clearly, you and even hash flow is getting surfaced now. Clearly, you want to uh, use the meta aggregator, so this gives you the best of the best of swap rates. Mux is a cross-chain perp, 60 mil cap, FDV, 14%. Uh, Mux. Let's see what Mux is. No. I want to go there. I'm Max. I don't want to own gambling necessarily. The, the only gambling that I own, you know, I never got into uh, GMX in the size that I would have needed for it to be something uh, be, being content to own. Uh, the, the extent that, that I am involved with like a, a ownership of uh, that type of 
Enterprise as uh, Hero on, uh, on Solana, HXRO, um, and I, I'm fine. I don't I don't need to own uh, you know like a the synthetics ecosystem on Optimism and Quenta and on and and all those types of assets. Uh, I don't want that type of cash flow. Uh, the core thesis remains Forex, the exchange of one asset for another. And that's why I always talk about stable coins. I think that's the biggest narrative in all of crypto. Um, MCB. Oh, that's Mux. Uh, yeah, Llama only shows DEX aggregator results. Sometimes the DEX aggregator does pick up the swap with only Uniswap. Yeah, for like obviously shit that doesn't exist anywhere else, like Pepe. <laughs> um... <laughs> Pepe coin. People buy this shit. I mean, look, you're, you're even getting better liquidity. Remarkable, whatever. The same story I had earlier about Uniswap. It almost makes zero sense to ever use Uniswap. Um, yeah, exactly. It's a 100x Lev bucket shop. What, Mux? Eh. You know, just not something I'm interested in enterprise ownership. Not too much gambling. I go like, the four, five years, six years. Stable coins, I love when I hear from USDC. I'm concerned about CBDCs. I'm, I'm into the permissionless uh, currency unit and exchange of one currency unit for another from a global perspective. And, we're, and the euro stables will come. And that's, you know, Curve just has all those ticks. That's just the, what it is. You're welcome, Alex. Guys, the APY... On STG is not correct. One basis point from the volume goes to all stakers. So with this volume, it should be higher. That's very interesting. I wish I had a very clear uh, presentation of how much revenue it generates. It's a quite a meaningful asset of the guard to cross-chain liquidity flow. And you have the competitors, but I think Stargate is far in the lead. If you've seen their post in the last couple months of the total amount of volume, of messaging volume, this massive. Uh, and that's a big deal. And the reason I love stuff like that is because, you know, folks will get attached to a chain. Like, oh, arbitrum, or optimism, or what? But, but this is at all chains. Cross-chain messaging is everything. It's a... A concept it's a scale and scope that's bigger than any specific chain that's why it was a december 21 narrative seamless cross-chain liquidity at some point you should be able to interact on ethereum mainnet and buy something and the liquidity comes from any of the chains you're getting liquidity on arbitrum flowing through liquidity on optimism and you get your transaction what you bought back on mainnet all facilitated by a consolidated user interface uh, that doesn't even ask you to uh, select the chains that you want to cha uh, exchange with. And that'd be quite interesting at some point in the future. Balancer. Good old Balancer. Look at that liquidity. Quarter billion dollars worth of liquidity. I think Balancer we can zoom out to a weekly. Higher lows, you know, it would have been nice, uh, but most of them, I did, I got good numbers. I think my positions were in the fives, maybe upper fours. A little bit of lingering dust from back here. The I always get the initial leg down, and then obviously 20, 22, everything fell apart, end of 21. It's not incredibly productive, but there is consideration, especially from a bunny perspective, uh, because because uh, the uh, VE lit is ETH lit as uh, an 8020 balancer LP. So those transaction fees should ultimately get recycled to VE lit um, balancer. Vote rentals, the elite, and there was a cycle 
uh, not too long ago where that was the case and that's a nice revenue stream because if you own balancer uh, you're able to vote for it and ultimately uh, you know with a decent time horizon it could potentially be meaningful because they surface those bow uh, incentives to uh, to the elite holders uh, this is obviously a marginal value uh, relatively small but in five years that could be quite interesting as a source of revenue if that if balancer does uh, is capable of attracting uh, a fair amount of liquidity off of uniswap which goes back to uniswap anyway so the hard the hard thing about investing is that you see something interesting that makes sense to you but if it doesn't make sense to the average market actor it doesn't necessarily pick up the greatest technology isn't always the best investment so that's a critical thing to express in position sizing there's a risk to investing in something you think is the next big technology it's not necessarily the next big investment food for thought Raul what do you mean by cross-chain messaging so the way layer zero works is it sends a message from mainnet to a to a corresponding contract on Arbitrum. And after that message is confirmed, uh, it's able to do a swap on layer zero, uh, on um, Stargate. Stargate has the liquidity. The liquidity atop the messaging of layer zero. So layer zero sends the message to transfer the liquidity, and the liquidity is managed by Stargate. So that's how that technology works. Very broad strokes, Raul. Trey, I think Aura Bow is paying like 40% has been consistently. Yes, Aura Bow does well. It was in the 50s, and obviously that's from a compounding, so that means it's less from an APR standpoint. Um, it's it's a consideration. It's down to 38, and I think uh, market directionality indicates expect further depreciation. Let's go back to the chart. I expect further depreciation of everything until we start to see M2, you know, really give a good rip to the upside. Let's just isolate US M2. I mean, that, that dip right there is a relatively big drain. Where's domestic liquidity? Do I not have the chart up? Let's open up domestic liquidity. Code layout. Domestic US liquidity. Well, this is why the markets are a little uh, malaise, a little tranquil. Uh, domestic liquidity came down over the last week. It's a meaningful, meaningful amount down. So, you know, let's see what happens with First Republic. You know, FDIC doesn't mean any liquidity tap is going to be turned on soon. I expect liquidity to continue to drain. I expect to see a general trend continuing down. Uh, interest rate hike of 25 basis points uh, sh should do exactly what it's been doing uh, all of 22 which is decrease collateral prices which increases international liquidity conditions which has been supporting the markets markets get addicted to rate change uh, directionality so when you start to see a rate change and rate cuts is when you really like ooh, this is not the time this is not going to be good they're on the defensive uh, we could see some really isolated deflationary pressures in different markets well that's the beauty of the crypto markets it's not a market specific to a nation it's a market of all nations it's accessible from anywhere by anyone and the question is uh, you know, where's capital going to flow? And I, I think it's the prime destination for a tremendous amount of capital, uh, depending on, uh, you know, respective considerations in, in different nations. Uh, I think uh, Britain's going to do a lot of the driving of the narrative over the next five years. You know, Euro dollars and global currency availability and and uh, who, who would, you know, there's plenty of reason why uh, they would take advantage of U.S. being very regulatory tight and they could be very regulatory loose. And then the regulatory arbitrage means capital flows there. Innovators, builders, companies go there. And that's a big, big it creates a massive opportunity. If the U.S. over regulates, even perceived to over regulate, um, it uh, 
engages the same regulatory arbitrage phenomena that occurred with gambling, especially online gambling. And is folks here talking about perp taxes? I'm pretty sure that qualifies as online gambling. <laughs> uh, you welcome, Raul. Uh, uh, do you believe in Q3, Q4, we are going into recession? Uh, what is a recession? Uh, which state is in a recession? Uh, what's why, why is a national recession defining the overall state of a nation more meaningful than individual states? I mean, I'm pretty sure Florida's. I'm pretty sure uh, uh, George Gavin talked about this a while back. Uh, like half the states of the nation are in recession, but the states can't print currency to. Uh, to compensate for their balance sheets. A very precarious situation, especially in California, and their deficit, uh, tax receipt shortfall. Uh, you know, folks get overwhelmed and overfocus on the national balance sheet, neglecting the state balance sheets, and then folks talk, talk and think too much about just the U.S. and what about other countries. And that's the beauty of the crypto markets. Is the crypto markets, you don't just, well, you can't just look at the U.S. You can't just look at Fed policy. You can't just look at U.S. recession. What's going on in the rest of the world? is maybe more important than what's going on in the U.S. if you allocate the crypto markets. I mean, this has got to be, and Japan, obviously, with their fiscal policies. Japan, look at that. Do you see that? You saw that difference? Uh, let's isolate. This is obviously over a six-month window. Let's isolate to a f one month. With Japan, you uh, global M2, and these are the the three bigger currencies. If you throw China in there, it's it's even bigger. How accurate are those numbers? If you throw China in there, it's up. But if you take out China and you got Japan, Europe, and the U.S. It's relatively flat. Look what happens when you take out Japan. So if you think about it, Japan is single-handedly supporting markets. So why are we looking to the U.S.? So Japan, you, you that's how critical they are to the entire equation. So uh, with that, this chart alone, take this, and compare it to this, the, you would think that someone would be screaming, maybe like me, we should be looking at Japan. If you want to understand where markets are going, you should be looking at Japan. <laughs> so if Japan does what they do, good or bad, it has a tremendous effect on availability of currency units globally. And currency units, especially in hyper-financialized markets, which is basically what the world is dependent on for tax receipts at this point, uh, is, is very much dependent on any one of the, the primary currency issuers and their respective M2 or co and contribution of their M2 to the overall uh, M2 construct, which is this. And Japan has kept global currency supply stable. Uh, for those almost all of 22 this is why japan is why 22 was not as bad as it was from a depreciation standpoint oh shit and that's right here in this chart currency supply okay all right so i don't know about recession and what does it mean does it, we, do we see the job numbers tick up or is your job on the line is that the risk is that the concern is that or is you thinking about recession from an investment standpoint, in which case that's just the U.S. and that's why we're looking at the rest of the world from an investment standpoint. It's a very different topic of conversation. Uh, you know, how a recession affects employment is another story. But I'm much more interested in it from a investment standpoint. Recession doesn't affect my industry much at all. There is always. Uh, uh, jobs uh, in software development 
It is a, still remains to this day for the last 13 years of my career. It's a completely unsaturated market. It's quite extraordinary. It's been an extraordinary ride. Thank you all for joining me today. Friday, April 28th, 12.48 p.m. This is a long one today, but good content. Thank you all for uh, asking uh, for all those tickers. 15 people left in the stream, 13 likes. I wish you all a wonderful day. Tell everyone to subscribe after party on Discord for the most rational community in the entire crypto space. Peace.